Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, I want to welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We're still waiting on a couple of folks to join. We've got a large crowd today. Okay, well everyone, my name is Nikki Thompson and I am currently the campaign manager for the Fair Funding Coalition, which is a coalition of 25 plus organizations that are all about making sure that we have the revenue necessary to pay for the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Again, I wanna welcome you to our webinar today, the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, what passed the General Assembly. Uh, this webinar is co-hosted by the Maryland Center on Economic Policy and Strong Schools Maryland. Things were moving very fast at the end of the shortened legislative session this year, uh, something that hasn't happened since the Civil War. So we have a lot to share. There's a lot to update you on um, from a very interesting legislative session. So the good news is that the legislature did pass the blueprint for Maryland's future, yay, uh, which will make a huge difference in the educational experiences of children all across the state, regardless of their zip, zip code. Uh, today, we're going to be taking a look back at what passed during the session. This is also going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So just a review of our agenda. We're first going to have Lindsay Malig Mayhew of Strong Schools Maryland, who will review what was in the Blueprint Bill and how it changed the way that we fund our schools. Then we're going to have Christopher Meyer of the Maryland Center on Economic Policy, who will discuss the legislation that was aimed at raising new revenue to support these investments in our schools and other priorities. And then finally, we're going to give you plenty of time to ask as many questions as you need at the end. You can submit your question at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen on Zoom or in the comments section if you're watching on the live stream on Facebook. And again, if you can't get into the webinar or you know someone who can't get into the webinar because we are at capacity, we're full, send them on over to the Maryland Center on Economic Policies Facebook page where we are Facebook live streaming the webinar. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay. Hi everyone, I am Lindsay Malig Mayhew, the Director of Partnerships with Strong Schools Maryland. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit campaign advocating for the passage and implementation of the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. You can find out more about what we do at our website, strongschoolsmaryland.org. Sign up for our emails and follow us on Facebook and Twitter to make sure you're getting the latest and greatest about all things Blueprint. Today, I'm going to give you a general overview of the Blueprint funding formula. General because Maryland has one of the most complex education funding formulas in the nation, and then the Blueprint adds on to that. It is very important for us to break down this complex formula, though, um, because we need to continue advocacy, holding elected officials and school systems accountable to actually implementing the Blueprint although it has not passed yet. Um, the General Assembly has passed the legislation, but we are waiting for the governor's action. He can either sign the legislation, veto it, or let it go into law without his signature. So let's jump right in. What is the funding formula? Essentially, it's designated funding for specific policy initiatives. The largest allocations in the current formula are for foundation funding and targeted funding. The foundation amount is essentially a base amount needed to cover the cost of general education services, which includes the staffing and operating of a school system. The targeted amount is basically um, funding for specific um, support that students need in addition to the foundation amount. The blueprint then adds on um, designated funding for new initiatives that are integrated into the foundation and then also new initiatives for the targeted funding, which you can see include additional resources for students experiencing concentrations of poverty, 
We've got improving teacher diversity and quality, providing affordable pre-K, and improving students' college and career readiness. That last component of the funding formula is categorical funding. This is essentially state funding for specific programs like the Accountability Implementation Board and school-based health centers. So how much is all of this good stuff gonna cost? The state funding comes to about 2.8 billion more annually by 2030. And then the local funding is about 566 million more annually. Again, by 2030, this is a phase in, it's gradual. These increases don't happen all at once. You can see that the foundation makes up most of the designated funding with those targeted funding um, components making up most of the rest. So let's start with the biggest component, the foundation. How, what is it, how much does it cost? The current foundation is supposed to provide funding for enough teaching positions for all of our general education, elective and intervention classes and planning time. Uh, we've got instructional support positions included in that. These are our coaches and teacher professional develop teacher professional development. Um, their service delivery positions. These are nurses, counselors, social workers. It also includes staffing for school administration and district level positions, and then all of the materials that are required for instruction. The blueprint then adds on to this current foundation. You can see the funding phases in from 2022 to 2033. This is close to a 60% increase in foundation funding. This covers teacher salary increases of 10% by 2024, uh, base pay increases of $60,000 by 2026, and teacher planning time increases from 20% to 40% of teacher working hours. There's also funding allocations for new initiatives. Under college and career readiness, we have post-college and career readiness advancement that includes um, advanced placement courses, international baccalaureate programs, and dual enrollment. And then there's interventions for students who don't meet the college and career readiness standard by 10th grade. Then there's a ninth grade monitoring system to catch those students in ninth grade, so they are ensured to have those interventions by 10th grade. Under more resources to ensure student success, we have a behavior health coordinator for each school system, and then there's trauma-informed services for student social, emotional, and behavioral health. So that's the foundation amount. How do we provide that targeted funding to make sure students get the support they need? So we start at the bottom there with our foundation funding. Then for each additional support, we add on additional funding for those supports that students need to access learning opportunities. Um, you can see that foundation funds phases in over 10 years from 2022 to 2033. The special education funding ramps up to an 80% increase and then levels out at 60% more funding over the current formula amount. English language learner funding increases by about 25% and compensatory education, which is funding for students experiencing poverty increases by about 20%. The blueprint adds on additional support for students experiencing concentrations of poverty. This funding phases in based on school eligibility criteria. So schools with 80% or more of students experiencing poverty are eligible now. And then students, um, then that percentage decreases annually until schools with 55% of students experiencing poverty meet the eligibility criteria. This grant funds two positions. There's a community schools coordinator and a health practitioner at a community at one of these schools. Um, there's also additional funding per student for schools to adopt programs that meet the specific needs of their students. This is for things like behavior or sorry, um, before and after school activities and then behavior interventionists. So we've got supports for our students. What about teachers? How does the blueprint improve teacher quality? There's a new four tier career ladder with advancement tied to student achievement and professional development. This will be um, created with these tiers by each county board by 2023. 
It starts with additional licensure, then we move to teacher pursuing and then obtaining a master's degree or national board certification. And then there's teacher leadership positions and that's to keep teachers, our best teachers in the classroom so they don't have to move to an administrative track in order to get those pay and responsibility increases. A note on national board certification. It is no longer a requirement for all teachers as originally recommended by the Kerwin Commission. It is required to get those tier three and four positions and it is tied to significant increases um, in pay. It's also required for all principals starting in the year 2029. So we've got high quality teachers. Um, what about early childhood education? Who is going to qualify for substitute, subsidized pre-kindergarten under the blueprint? This is also a tiered system. It implements a sliding scale based off of family income. So for a three and four year old child with a family income of below 300% of the federal poverty level, there's no cost. For a four year old child with a family income of between 300 to 600% of the federal poverty level, there's a subsidized cost and this subsidy will be determined by January of 2021. Then to, for children with family income above 600% of the federal poverty level, they are not eligible for subsidies. And you can see that funding phases in from 2023 to 2033, and there's about a 50% increase in funding for um, pre-K. So we know students need to be prepared to enter school. They also need to be prepared to leave it and be successful. We talked about some of the college career readiness initiatives that were included in the foundation funding. How else will the blueprint make sure students are prepared for post-secondary success? Take a little journey with me on this slide. We're gonna start in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. And here's where we make sure students don't fall behind during those pivotal literacy development years. Um, we This is through something called transitional supplemental instruction. It funds tutoring for individualized interventions uh, for low performing K through third grade students. Then moving right on to over to high school, ideally students stay on grade level and meet the college and career standard by 10th grade after which they can participate in expanded career and technical education programs. Under the blueprint, the statewide CTE goal will be 45% of students will participate in an apprenticeship or receive an industry recognized credential. And that goal is slated to be achieved by 20, the 2029-2030 school year. All of this good stuff results in high school graduates who are better prepared to meet our current workforce demands. The transitional supplemental instruction funding phases in starting in 2022, ramps up by 2024, and then phases out by 2027 with the idea that the blueprint will have been implemented for long enough to where we don't need this intervention anymore. So we talked about foundation, we've talked about um, targeted funding, that leaves us with categorical funding. What is it? This is designated funding for specific initiatives that support students in schools, but aren't, aren't included in the other two categories. Um, most of this funding is covered by the state and it's allocated directly to service providers or programs, not necessarily to the local school boards. Um, several of these categories are on your bookshelf there. I'm just going to highlight a few. The blueprint provides 126 more new duty centers by 2030. Those provide early childhood education services and supports. That's for children from birth to age five. Blueprint also provides 30 new PADI centers by 2030. That's to support families. And then a big change under the Blueprint is funding for the Accountability Implementation Board. This establishes and monitors a statewide accountability and financial tracking system created with MSDE. Um, also includes expert review teams. These will go out to all of the schools in the state by 2030 and will provide additional support to um, schools that aren't meeting expected outcomes. The AIB will have a significant role in something called the Checkpoint Amendment 
that was added. If the AIB finds that the blueprint is not being implemented as intended by 2025, the major education aid will be restricted just to the rate of inflation for the following 2026 school year. You might be wondering at this point, who is paying for all this? Well, the state and local governments are sharing the funding responsibility for the parts of the formula considered major education aid. The local contribution is now required. That's called maintenance of effort. Previously, the local governments were responsible for just the foundation amount. So this expanded local share is designed to make sure that all students receive adequate funding for all their education services in every part of the state. This local share requirement was one of the most contentious Kerwin Commission recommendations since it disproportionately impacted certain districts. So the blueprint has integrated several measures um, to provide support for local jurisdictions to fund their share and level out that impact. In fact, all jurisdictions receive increased state aid under the blueprint. The formula is wealth equalized, meaning the local share is determined by local wealth. So the state will cover more of the cost for low wealth districts. The state funds most of the concentration of poverty grants. It also funds most of the categorical initiatives. And the blueprint was amended to include something called the Maximum Education Effort Index. This measures a local government's ability to fund education by comparing each local share to an average of all the local shares combined across the state. If the local share is determined to be higher than the average, an adjustment is made to provide relief to jurisdictions with lower wealth. Speaking of amendments, there was a pause amendment that was added. Um, this is similar to the checkpoint amendment. Major education aid is restricted to the rate of inflation if the December 2020 general fund estimate is 7.5% is less than the March 2020 estimate. And this was to um, compensate for some of the economic uncertainty that we, will be, we might be experiencing. So I know this was a lot of information, um, but don't worry. There's a lot more details on our Blueprint Funding Formula Explainer, which you can find on our website, strongschoolsmaryland.org. Again, you can sign up for email updates and follow us on Facebook and Twitter um, to get the more information about the funding formula. There's a lot of links on there that take you to um, details and more specifics and get the latest news on the blueprint. Again, this legislation is will not go into effect until the governor makes a decision. So we need your continued attention and advocacy on the blueprint. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen and letting me talk with you about this groundbreaking legislation that is going to create world-class schools for all Maryland students. Thank you so much, Lindsay. A round of applause for Lindsay. Thank you. Um, so we have a little bit of time to uh, ask a couple clarifying questions that were asked during your presentation, Lindsay, if you don't mind. Uh, first, the question was, is this with inflation adjusted dollars or will the amounts need to be increased to compensate for inflation? I'm not sure what this is referring to, um, but all of the references to inflation, inflation adjustments um, have specific years tied to them. So for instance, the um, checkpoint amendment would be in 2026 $20, dollars. So the, the rate of inflation will be determined at the time that it needs to be determined. Thank you. Another quick clarifying question before we move to our next segment. Uh, Lindsay, how many schools qualify for these student resources now? 
Well, actually, all schools are receiving funding for the um, first three categories, special education, English language learners, and compensation or compensatory education. Um, there will be, I'm not sure how many schools statewide are going to get the concentration of poverty grants, um, but th there are schools in every single county that will get these grants. Um, and this has actually already been implemented under the um, kickstart of the blueprint from last year. So several schools have already started getting this funding and are operating under the community school model. Thank you. And this is my last one before we move on, um, but not the last question. There will definitely be more time for questions at the end, but it's your last question, Lindsay, you can get off the hot seat. Um, could you spend a bit more time on after school funding for whom, uh, what type and how much if there are any specifics required? Yeah, good question. And um, this illustrates the need of, for continued advocacy and knowing what's actually supposed to be funded in the formula. Um, the before and after school funding is tied to um, the community school per student dollars. So if a school receives the concentration of poverty grant and they're also eligible for the per student dollars, there is a menu of resources that they can choose from. So the before and after school activity funding is just one of many things a school can choose to integrate. So if a school chooses to integrate um, that particular service, the before and after school um, programs, um, they will do that based off of the um, needs assessment that the community school coordinator will conduct the prior year to receiving the additional per student dollars. So it's going to be up to the schools. If you are a person who thinks that those are essential services for children, um, you can advocate for the schools to adopt those. There's a lot of flexibility at the local school level to make sure the needs of the students in that school are met. Thank you. Thank you so much. And don't try to remember all this information, guys. You are going to get a recording of this webinar. Even those who weren't able to get in because of the max cap and were over on Facebook Live, if you're registered, you're going to get the materials. So don't worry yourself. Okay, so we're going to go over to uh, Christopher Meyer for the Maryland Center on Economic Policy. Thanks again, Lindsay. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Lindsay, for a really informative explanation of uh, where things have gone. Um, so if we can get my slides up. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we're really facing unprecedented times. No one could have anticipated that we would pass historic improvements to Maryland's public schools right as a historic pandemic was upending society. Uh, so we're facing big challenges, and one of the biggest of those is to strengthen and protect our public investments uh, during a deep economic downturn. With smart uh, policy choices, we can minimize the damage and move forward on making Maryland public schools among the best in the world. Uh, so the General Assembly made important but incomplete progress on raising revenue in this year's session. Uh, a few important bills passed. Several, uh, several more moved forward, but didn't make it across the finish line. Uh, and legislation, legislators also failed to advance a number of bills that could have made our tax code more effective and more equitable. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll start with what passed. Uh, two bills to modernize consumption taxes, as well as the first step toward legalizing sports betting. Uh, so House Bill 732, um, enacted a tax on gross receipts from digital advertising. Uh, so this is a tax on businesses. Um, this tax could potentially raise up to $250 million a year once it actually goes into effect. Uh, but this uh, faces some possible legal issues, both with federal law and potentially constitutionally, which has to do with uh, newspapers and other media that uh, sell digital ads. Um, 
So that litigation will likely mean that's revenue that will happen down the road. Uh, that bill also included uh, an increased cigarette tax and uh, bringing vape products into parity with other tobacco products. Uh, and that's expected to raise about $80 million or more. Uh, the next bill that passed, House Bill 932, uh, expanded Maryland sales tax base to include digital books. So that means things like streaming video, um, music downloads, uh, paid uh, apps, uh, subscription services, things like that. Uh, and so this is an important step to uh, essentially bring our tax, our sales tax into the 21st century um, because people aren't really buying things like CDs, tapes anymore, but they're doing that same consumption online. Uh, and that will bring in about $80 million at first, up to about $120 million uh, by fiscal year 2025. Uh, and then finally, uh, Senate Bill 4 uh, created a referendum uh, to go on the ballot this November uh, to put sports betting in the state constitution. So eventually, uh, if the referendum passes and if we pass implementation legislation, then sports betting is expected to raise about $20 million uh, each year. And that is a fairly uncertain number, both because we don't know what will happen with the refer referendum and in future legislative sessions, but also the amount of revenue sports betting will bring in is subject to some uncertainty. Okay, next slide. Uh, so four, four more bills made significant progress, but didn't pass before the session's early end. Uh, so the first of those was a bill that would close a loophole for opportunity zones, a type of business subsidy created uh, by the 2017 Trump tax law. Uh, so that tax law actually automatically introduced a loophole into our state tax code uh, that would essentially give certain investors a tax break on their capital gains. Uh, that bill passed at the House of Delegates uh, with a weakening amendment. Um, as introduced, it would have raised about $15 million a year. Uh, next up, uh, a bill passed the House that would have closed a number of uh, corporate tax loopholes that allowed large uh, multi-state corporations to art artificially shift their profits or enable them to have certain profits that essentially aren't attributable to any state, so-called nowhere income. Uh, these are bills, uh, these are reforms that have been introduced many times in the past, but have never made any progress. Uh, so the fact that these passed the House is a pretty major um, piece of progress. And together that bill is expected to raise upward of $180 million a year. Uh, next, a bill to uh, end a number of ineffective business tax subsidies uh, passed the House of Delegates. So this was a bill uh, introduced by Ways and Means Chair uh, Delegate Kaiser. Um, there were a number of sil similar bills that didn't advance, uh, but this would have addressed a number of tax credit programs that um, the Department of Legislative Services and Academic Research have found again and again don't really help our economy. And that would have um, prevented about $45 million a year in revenue losses. Uh, and then finally, uh, a bill to create a sales tax on certain luxury good, uh, luxury services uh, from things like um, fur storage, art storage, uh, and a number of similar services uh, passed both the House and Senate, albeit with some weakening amendments that uh, narrowed the list of what actually is subject to the tax. Um, as it was amended, it would have raised up to about $26 million at most. Um, and even though that passed both chambers, uh, there was no time to reconcile the two versions before uh, adjournment. Next slide. Uh, so many more bills didn't move forward. Uh, so there are five bills that would have improved our upside down tax code, uh, which currently allows the wealthiest 1% of individuals uh, in Maryland to pay a smaller share of their income in state and local taxes than the rest of us do. Uh, so that includes a bill that would have partially offset uh, special treatment of capital gains in the federal tax code with a 1% surtax, uh, a bill to repeal a 2014 
uh, change that essentially increased uh, the amount of money to $5 million that could be exempt from the estate tax. Uh, another bill would have uh, fully offset the um, so-called carried interest loophole that allows certain financial uh, hedge fund and private equity managers to uh, pay a special low rate on some of their compensation. Um, and then the biggest would have been uh, a bill to restructure and reform our income tax, uh, which would have reduced tax responsibilities for most low and middle income families, while asking more of the uh, wealthiest individuals. And in a similar vein, uh, a change to our non-resident income tax, with, which dis disproportionately uh, is applied to uh, relatively wealthy individuals. So these uh, bills both would have raised significant revenue altogether uh, in the vicinity of a billion dollars a year, um, and also made our tax code fairer in two ways. Uh, both they would have asked more from the wealthiest individuals who currently pay less under our current system, and they would have rebalanced our tax code uh, to ask more of people who earn their income or who gain their income through wealth rather than work. Uh, and we know uh, we have a wide racial wealth gap in this country. So taxing things like capital gains uh, and inherited wealth would make a more um, racially equitable tax code. Uh, next slide. So four more bills uh, would have closed uh, loopholes, as well as taking another step to modernize our tax code. Uh, so one that did not move forward uh, would have closed the so-called LLC loophole that allows certain large businesses to uh, es essentially escape paying the corporate income tax at all by changing their form of legal organization. So this bill would have applied a 4% surtax only on those companies that have over a million dollars in annual profits, uh, which is expected to be less than about 2% of all pass-through companies. It would have protected true small businesses and raised upward of $300 million a year. Uh, there are also two subsidy reforms that would have together raised about $32 million a year, uh, one that repealed or restricts a wide range of tax subsidies, and one that closed another loophole in the 2017 Trump tax law. Uh, which essentially allowed uh, people to use 529 savings to put toward uh, private school tuition rather than its initial intention uh, of being a vehicle for saving for college or university. Uh, so that bill would essentially return 529 to its original intention to uh, end a loophole that Maryland legislators didn't even choose to put public resources into private schools. Uh, and then finally, perhaps one of the most talked about bills from this past session, uh, House Bill 1628, uh, would have raised, uh, expanded our sales tax base to apply to essentially all services. Uh, that inclu includes both consumer services, haircuts, car repairs, uh, as well as business to business services, legal services, accounting, payroll processing. Uh, and altogether, by 2025, that would have raised nearly $3 billion a year. Uh, and that bill died pretty loudly in committee. Um, that bill has a few policy design issues uh, having to do with the way that um, sales tax on business inputs tend to be passed on to customers in the form of higher uh, prices. Uh, a scaled back version that addressed those issues would likely raise about $600 million a year. Next slide. Uh, so the legislature also considered uh, two bills that would have expand local options for raising revenue. Uh, so we know that the blueprint calls for significant new contributions from counties to public schools, uh, as is appropriate. Uh, and we need to look at ways to enable counties to raise the, raise the necessary revenue. Uh, so one bill would have allowed uh, 
counties to apply their income taxes on brackets, similar to the state and federal income taxes, rather than a single rate as they're required to now. As introduced, that bill would have also increased the cap on the, income, on the county income tax rate from 3.2% to 3.5%. Uh, that bill passed the House of Delegates, uh, except without the provision to raise the rate cap, uh, but ultimately didn't go anywhere in the Senate uh, before the end of session. And then finally, another bill would have allowed uh, counties greater flexibility in setting um, property tax rates. So currently, nearly all uh, real property, so residential, commercial, and so forth, has to be taxed at the same uh, rate within any given county. Uh, and this bill would have allowed greater flexibility that has been confirmed to be within the state constitution to uh, apply differential rates depending on the type of property. Uh, and that bill did not advance. Uh, next slide. And then uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, social distancing, and the legislature's abrupt adjournment throw us into uncharted waters. Next slide. Uh, over the past five weeks, we've seen uh, job losses equal to nearly the entirety of 2009 uh, at the height of the Great Recession. Uh, so this truly is kind of an unprecedented place for our economy to be in. Uh, next slide. And with those necessary public health measures, uh, those deep job losses, and the resulting drop in consumer spending, uh, they're already having a substantial fiscal impact. So the state controller's office estimates that we could lose as much as $2.8 billion just by the end of this fiscal year. Uh, and based on reasonable assumptions, while there's considerable uncertainty, uh, it's easy to imagine uh, a loss next year in the vicinity of $5 billion. Uh, but that could be much more or much less. Uh, next slide. So there's absolutely no question that the blueprint for Maryland's future has encountered an obstacle. But this is public education. Children across Maryland face obstacles every day, and a big part of educators' job is to navigate those obstacles. Next. Uh, there are lots of important reasons to invest in education. Uh, it strengthens our democracy. It really is just the foundation of our society. But among the most important is that it lays the foundation for a long-term prosperity. Uh, surveys repeatedly find that business leaders' number one priority in choosing where to locate over taxes, over labor costs, over real estate costs, is having access to skilled workers. And that's what a great education system does. Similarly, families want to locate in a state where they know that they can set their kids up for success. Uh, and we can see on the right that indeed states that have more college graduates are more prosperous. Uh, but we don't have to take those surveys or this graph uh, at face value. There is rigorous research showing without question that better funding for schools today means better pay for those adults tomorrow. Next slide. So we know that our shared investments in education support our long-term prosperity, and they also support our economy today uh, in the form of jobs, wages, and spending. And protecting those services can buffer a downturn, uh, and slashing them threatens to make it much worse. So Maryland public schools today employ about 135,000 people uh, and pay about $7.8 billion in annual wages. Those wages, because they're going to middle-income families who generally don't have enormous uh, accumulated savings, go straight back into local businesses, groceries, clothing, and so forth. And that, in turn, creates more jobs. Next. As we face serious economic uncertainty, what does that mean for tax policy? Uh, maintaining adequate revenue is essential to protect, protect jobs. We know that because uh, any loss in revenue because the state has to balance its budget uh, immediately translates into lost jobs. And so a fair tax code that asks the most of the wealthiest is the most, most pro-growth way to raise that revenue. Uh, 
when working people, such as this healthcare worker, uh, get income, that almost entirely goes toward groceries, clothes, books, car payments, other essentials of life. And if there's a little left over, they'll save it for retirement or for a rainy day. On the other hand, the wealthiest individuals, next slide, tend to spend a much smaller share of each individual dollar. You can buy a nicer car, buy nicer food, but ultimately there's only so much that you can spend on these consumer goods. And so ultimately, uh, wealthy individuals tend to save or invest a much larger share of each additional dollar of income. This means that taxing wealthy individuals, as well as large businesses, has a minimal effect on the level of demand, which is what matters for jobs during a downturn. Uh, and this is especially true of individuals uh, with the largest amounts of built up wealth, uh, which there's research recently out of Johns Hopkins University showing this, which means that a more racially just tax code is also the most pro growth during a downturn. Next. Uh, so we have a number of options uh, moving forward to protect our current investments and to build world class schools in Maryland. I am going over time wise, so I won't go uh, in detail into each of these. But to start with, we should finish the reforms that didn't make it this year, closing corporate and big business loopholes, eliminating ineffective subsidies, and fixing our upside down tax code. However, because we know we're facing deep revenue losses right now that are likely to continue, but we don't know for how long, we're gonna to have to go bigger and bolder. And so there are a number of ways that we can do that, uh, both by um, enacting additional reforms or by looking at the tax rates that we ask people to contribute. Next. Similarly, we should enable uh, local jurisdictions to uh, raise the revenue they need because they're facing a very similar situation to the state. And so some of those same reforms that were considered this year uh, would be significant progress toward that. Uh, we should also consider a thoughtful sales tax reform that expands the base only to consumer services and then to uh, dampen the impact on working families. We can offset that with working family tax credits such as expanding the earned income tax credit or creating a state level child tax credit. And then finally, uh, this isn't something that Maryland lawmakers can do directly uh, but we need to make sure the federal government is doing its job. To date, the federal government has uh, transferred to Maryland $2.3 billion for uh, direct response to the pandemic, as well as a little over $200 million uh, for K-12 education aid. Uh, that aid is welcome, but it's simply deeply inadequate. Uh, we know that Federal aid to state and local governments is among the most effective ways to boost the economy during the downturn. Uh, we also know that the war among the states is not real. Needlessly slashing public investments hurts everyone in every state. So by um, taking steps to reform our own tax code, both at the state level and locally, and calling on the federal government to do its job in protecting essential services, uh, we can move forward in protecting those services and also build work class schools in Maryland. Thank you. And thank you, Chris. Round of applause for Chris. Thank you for all of your great information. Uh, we're going to get to the part that you all have been waiting for. It's question time, guys. So get your questions in uh, at the Q&A section. Just go ahead and type them right now we're going to get to as many as we can and then if you are on the facebook live put them in the comment section we will try to get to those as well so we're going to start uh, with a couple of questions that have already rolled in you guys are firing them off that's awesome thank you uh, so first question um the word curriculum is brought up quite often in the bill for the blueprint for maryland's future are we planning on switching curriculum in public school, especially since research is showing that Common Core has results? If not, what curriculum is being changed? I think that. Um, I can answer that. Um, Maryland State Department of Education is under the blueprint will be developing 
a voluntary curriculum. And the purpose of that is to promote um, the high quality instruction that is needed to prepare students to meet that CCR standard by 10th grade. Um, Common Core, I'm sure will be a part of it. Um, we know that the system we're using now is only preparing about 40% of our students um, to meet, to be college and career ready. So um, we know we have to do something different. Um, so the curriculum will be developed, but it is voluntary, a resource that uh, local jurisdictions can choose to use. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next question, I think this one's gonna be for Chris. Very short to the point, what about a carbon tax? Uh, thanks for that question. So a carbon tax uh, should certainly be on the table. Uh, it obviously can raise significant revenue and can uh, be an important way to fight climate change. Uh, similar to other consumption taxes, uh, a carbon tax would ask more of working families than of the wealthiest. Uh, so it would be smart to pair that with other measures uh, to reduce the impact on working families and to ensure that, ensure that the wealthiest are paying their share. But absolutely, I, I would agree. Thank you. I got a pretty juicy one. So whoever wants to answer it, feel free. What has blocked progress in the Senate? Does anyone want to take it? Um, I, I think maybe that question is referring to progress on the funding and revenue bills that were not passed. Um, that's my guess because the actual policy was passed. Um, I think some of the progress um, was blocked just by political issues. You know, the senators represent a wider range of constituents than the delegates do. Um, so you might have fiscally conservative parts of your county um, in addition to more um, liberal parts of your county, but you have to represent all of those. And I think the Senate usually tends to be more conservative um, in the bills that they pass typically. I don't know if Chris, you want to add something onto that or Nikki? I was going to sure. say, uh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I think there is a deeply entrenched and deeply misleading uh, narrative uh, among the public and even more so among policymakers about uh, the economic and political effects of uh, equitable and effective taxation. Uh, and so we're working hard every day to change that narrative, um, but it's hard work. And as Lindsay said, it's often harder work in the Senate. Great answers, guys. And I would just add, you know, as Chris mentioned earlier, uh, the timing could not have been predicted in any way, shape or form. And so I think this, this go around, there was some great, great progress made in the House with some of these reforms passing the House getting further than they ever have before. Uh, but we just kind of ran out of time because of COVID-19 to really do um, that education just and getting to some of those core We continue moving forward and keep up the good fight so that we can see some revenue raised. Was there a tech glitch? Should I kind of go out for a second? I could tell from your faces. <laughs> moving on to the next question. All I said was that everyone was right, if you guys missed that. Um, next question. Uh, what type of training will early childhood educators get to ensure that children are exposed to and participate in a preschool education that includes all the arts, including physical activities, hands-on exploration of the physical world, etc.? Um, I can answer that. Um, there is a pretty lengthy description of um, how to ensure high quality early childhood education in the bill. Um, some of those things are 
um, an evidence-based curriculum must be used. Um, there's culturally and linguistically responsive um, instruction, and there'll be a program evaluation. And um, on that evaluation, the programs are required to meet um, by within a certain time period, the highest ranking um, available um, in the state evaluation system. Um, arts education was mentioned and arts education funding is explicitly named in the foundation. Um, it's one of the many things in the foundation, so I didn't um, talk about it by name in my presentation, but it is in um, the foundation under the blueprint. It's actually been in um, funding, but everybody knows it keeps getting cut, but it's there again, <laughs> and it's named and called out to make sure it's funded. Thanks. Uh, so another question, what is the likelihood that this moves forward in FY21? And is there a possibility of there being cuts to education funding in light of the pandemic? Um, there is an enormous amount of uncertainty about everything, uh, which I don't think I need to tell anyone. Uh, I think that there is a significant risk of cuts to education. Uh, it's not one of the first places uh, policymakers want to cut, but ultimately uh, the state budget is mostly public schools and healthcare. Uh, so amid this deep revenue downturn, there really is a pretty hard choice between looking at our tax code and reforming it and asking more of those with the most or uh, potentially cutting public schools. Thanks, Chris. And that's a perfect segue to the next question. Uh, what can we do now to make sure that legislators will move on the bills to make sure wealthy pay their fair share? Do you want me to take that one or does anyone else? Oh, well, I can just add that um, definitely pay attention to the governor's next steps. Um, like I said, we're waiting to find out if he's going to veto the bill, he can sign the bill, or he can let it go into law without his signature. Um, we're expecting that decision in the next few weeks. So definitely stay posted to both of our organizations um, to find out what that decision is. And if there is a veto, we will then need to focus on our legislators and make sure they know that they are supported by us and other Marylanders. Um, we have their back to make that override veto vote. Yes, Lindsay. And the only other thing I would add is that uh, when you're discussing the blueprint for Maryland's future, make sure you're discussing revenue and how uh, the full implementation of the blueprint would require full funding and making sure that when you are reiterating that point that you're asking for funding that is fair and requires a fair share from everyone. And on to the next question. How do we obtain and keep top teachers? Uh, well, I talked about some of those initiatives. Um, we're looking at increasing teacher salaries. Um, I mentioned that overall salaries will increase by 10% by 2024. And the base salary for all teachers um, who are just starting out will be 60,000 by 2026. So um, the idea is that compensation mirrors that of um, other professionals with equal amounts of education and training that is required to teach. Um, there's also going to be professional development aligned to the new career ladder. The career ladder is designed to keep the best teachers in the classroom. Even assistant principals will have to teach for 20% of their working hours. Um, so it keeps our best and brightest in the classroom with our students continuing to teach them. Um, there's a lot of recruitment initiatives um, that will reach out to our best Maryland students and um, ensure diver the diversity that exists in Maryland. So we'll be reaching out to um, historically black colleges and universities and um, 
there are several initiatives that you can check out on our explainer that's on our website and it might have been emailed out to people who registered um, so make sure you check that last email you got from MDCEP as well for more details on that. Thank you. And next question. Where can I find a resource that shows the level to which jurisdictions across Maryland have met or are thinking about their local contribution? A couple people asked a question in this same vein. Um, that is going to be an attachment on the HB 1300 bill, um, the enrolled version. You can also see that chart on our one pager. Um, I can let you know just the highlights from that chart. Um, the jurisdictions that had to pay, um, that had the biggest increase in local contributions, even with the amendments to relieve um, local shares are Baltimore City, Talbot, and Kent. Um, but Baltimore City also got the highest amount of state aid as well. Um, Talbot and Kent also um, had significant increases in state aid as well. So overall, every, all the funding is going up for all the jurisdictions. Um, but there are still some that have to pay more than others. That chart can be found on the Maryland General, General Assembly website, or you can check our website and look at the um, local and state shares explainer. Thank you. Next question. Can you speak on the coordinated community supports partnership in the bill to address our students' health needs? Yeah, that um, partnership will fall under a consortium. So it will um, basically bring in community-based services and connect them to schools so that it's not just falling on the community schools coordinators and um, if the school hires a behavioral health interventionist. Um, and then we have that behavioral health um, coordinator at the school system level. Um, but outside of those positions, the consortium will bring in community-based services and supports that will also provide um, ways to meet student needs. Um, it's behavioral health, mental health, um, substance abuse needs, and physical health are all the community services that will be connected through the consortium. Thank you. Uh, moving on to some questions about uh, the governor's veto power. Due to the economic downturn, will a veto by the governor be hard to overturn now? Um, I do everything I can to avoid predicting the political future, uh, but certainly, you know, we're going to face some hard fiscal times. Um, and so that could be difficult. I would say that raising revenue to make sure that we have the resources uh, to invest in schools uh, is one step to you know, not make the governor happy necessarily, but to make sure that we can make those investments while balancing our budget. Uh, of course, well, I'll stick to that. Okay, and uh, next question. If uh, the governor vetoes this legislation, is there a plan being developed on how to uh, work with legislators to override the veto? Um, I can say that the Blueprint Coalition is still meeting and um, has developed a strategy for addressing a um, need for a veto override. So we're still um, planning on continuing advocacy following um, that decision. And so the best thing to do is just stay tuned to strongschoolsmaryland.org and um, the MBCPP website. Um, I know Nikki, you could talk about the Fair Funding Coalition and your advocacy efforts following a possible veto override as well. 
Thanks. Uh, so the, the Fair Funding Coalition is definitely on the lookout and paying attention to what happens. A couple of people have asked about the deadline in the chat. The governor has to make a decision by May 7th. So that's next week, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so once we get a decision, we'll definitely be moving forward on trying to make sure that we are educating legislators on uh, the realities of what raising revenue can do and how we can avoid some of those precarious predicaments that were described earlier, having to choose between cutting essential services and making sure our children have a first class education. So that's what we're gonna be doing with the Fair Funding Coalition. And uh, we are strong partners with Strong Schools Maryland and the Blueprint Coalition. So we are all gonna be uh, working very hard to make sure that everyone knows all the best possible options for our economy and for our children. I think we've gotten to everyone's questions. I'm gonna do a last call, last call for questions. So if you have any that you really want to get off your chest, uh, please let us know. Just waiting to see, I just wanna make sure I've gotten to everyone. Okay, one last question. Um, it is about the millionaire's tax. So how about bringing back the millionaire's tax in Maryland that Maryland had from 2008 to 2010? I know you mentioned it uh, earlier in your presentation, Chris, but maybe expound on it a little bit more and that'll be our last question. Sure, uh, thanks. So. Yeah, the uh, income tax reform that was introduced this year uh, by Delegate Smith did include a millionaire's bracket at 7%. Uh, the millionaire's tax we had in the past uh, had a millionaire's bracket at 6.25%. Um, so this year's reform essentially looked at the entire structure uh, along the entire income spectrum and Doing it in that way allowed it to raise uh, upward of $500 million a year. Uh, doing the millionaire's tax alone without looking at any of the other brackets would raise in the vicinity of 100 to 200 million. Uh, so it would definitely be a positive step, uh, but in light of both the size of the blueprint and the size of the uh, losses we're facing now, you know, the, the bigger the better. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, so we are going to wrap up. I just wanna thank everyone again for joining us today. Another round of applause for our panelists, both Chris and Lindsay for being with us, sharing their expertise. Thank you so much to both Strong Schools Maryland and Maryland Center on Economic Policy for being awesome allies and advocates in this fight for a 21st century education for Maryland's children. Again, thanks everyone for joining us on the webinar and on Facebook Live. Uh, if you have any questions that were answered because of time, uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, any of us. Uh, you feel free to reach out to me. Again, Nikki Thompson from the Fair Funding Coalition. We'll be happy to do any follow-up that's necessary. Um, thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.